Thank you so much for turning up at 9.30 on Sunday, the morning after the party. It's great to be <laughs> um, So, I'm Sophie and this is my colleague Rui. Um, we both work at Red Hat and we're part of an emerging technologies group. Um, so we're the RAD Analytics for IO team. Um, our team is uh, mixed, so we have some data scientists, which I definitely fit into and Rui fits into. And then we have some super techie uh, software experts, which really definitely fits into as well, and uh, the rest of the team. So we work to try and kind of bridge the gap between machine learning and uh, application developers and make it easy for machine learning experts to put their models into production with little friction. Um, so something that Rui and I have worked on over the last year and a half since we started Red Hat is recommendation engines. So today we'll just talk a bit about um, what they are, teach you how to use them, how to get going, um, and hopefully these skills will be transferable um, to other models and so on. So recommendation engines are everywhere. We'll talk about some movie data and we'll just help us manage that open source data for that, but we'll also look at music data and um, making recommendations where the data isn't quite so com concrete so people haven't rated a film for example um, they've simply listened to a song or not listened to a song. Bree's also going to tell us about how we put things into production and how we deal with streaming data in the recommendation engines. Um, okay. So we'll start by talking about the main recommendation algorithm class that we're going to use, which is collaborative filtering. Um, we'll look at parameter tuning, metrics, and consider some general good practices when putting machine learning algorithms into production and developing them and so on. And then we'll look at those implicit recommendations, so that's the case where someone just has listened to a song or they haven't, you don't know whether they like it or not. Post-processing is really important, so that's something that comes after the model um, before we return the recommendations to the user. So we'll see why that's important. We'll give you a chance to make some film predictions for yourself, see how terrible they are without post-processing, and then we'll do some simple post-processing to make the results better. And keep in mind how to do that in a production environment. And then finally, as I mentioned, we're going to talk about streaming data. So where the data is coming in, as it would in production, from users updating their preferences and so on. So we're going to work in Python today. Who has experience in Python? Okay. So all of the code is pretty much uh, written. We'll talk through it as we go. And uh, but please do stop and shout at any point in time. Hopefully this can be conversational rather than a two-hour lecture. Because that sounds awful to me and Ruby. And I guess you lot as well. So yes, please uh, ask questions, um, any issues with the code or things aren't working and, and so on. We're also going to use Apache Spark, so anyone used Spark before? Okay, so I mean Spark is fast, general, easy to use, uh, it's a parallel data analysis tool and it handles the parallelism itself with minimal input from you. So if you want to dive deep and find out how it's doing the parallelism you can, but we like it because it's just very straightforward. Another advantage is that it combines things like SQL, text processing, and machine learning, whereas previously you would have had a different engine for each. So it's pretty general, and we like that. We're going to be working in Jupyter Notebooks today. So anyone used Jupyter Notebooks before? Notebooks? Okay, cool. So if you haven't, no worries. We'll talk about um, how to use them, how they work. But in general, they're a lovely environment for exploratory data analysis and getting started with machine learning. So they have a nice mix of code, text, markdown, and you can get images in there as well. 
and yeah, we've got our patchy spark working in there. And finally, before we dive into the data, into the uh, notebook itself, we're going to need some data. So the data set we're going to work with today is the Movie Lens data set. Um, it's open source. A lot of online machine learning <coughs> tutorials use this data set. So I find that beneficial because when you sometimes when you run something or you're getting started, you kind of want to do a sanity check to check that what you're doing. It's sensible and it's nice to be able to follow what someone else has done first and see that your results are at least similar or not completely wacky. So this data set was curated by the Group Lens Research Project at the University of Minnesota and it's nicely organised. There's a small data set of 100,000 ratings. Users have made about films. That's what we're going to be using today for speed purposes but in practice if you really want to um, do some serious tuning and get going, then you might want to go back and have a go later with the full data set which has 26 million ratings. So let's see if everybody can get the notebook up and running. We'll talk about notebooks and we'll load in that data. So you can either use the QR code or you can so does the QR code take you to the binder? No, just to the Okay, so do you want to talk about setting up the binder? All right, so thank you everyone. As Sophie explained, so we're going to try to do this with a Jupyter Notebook, and Jupyter Notebook is a very good way of doing interactive code prototyping and experimenting. So you you can write your, your code in several languages, so Jupyter supports several kernels, not just Python. You can use Scala, you can use many other languages. And one of the advantages is that you can actually have immediate feedback on what you're doing. So instead of writing a long script and then running it and trying to find an error, you can actually execute portions of it, and you can have plots embedded, so if you want to visualize the data, it's, it's very useful. So the ones of you that actually want to have a go, so, so if you can try going to that repo, and if you go to that repo, you should have, let's just go here, you should have a button here, which, call, which is launch, my, launch Binder. And Binder is a service that provides uh, a containerized execution environment for Jupyter Notebook. So basically when you push this button, it turns the repo into a container and it runs the Jupyter book online for you. So you don't have to set up anything, you don't have to set up Jupyter or anything. So if you push the button, hopefully, you should see something like this. Okay. So the container is already built, so it caches the container. So it says it found the image, it's launching the server. So if you wait a little bit, it should take you like to a live Jupyter, to a live version of that Jupyter notebook. Has anyone used my binder before? No. Okay. Right. So as a future reference, if you do uh, uh, a Jupyter notebook and you want to share it with a colleague, with someone, instead of having them have all the hassle of you know setting up Python, setting up the package, and setting up everything, you just put a link to my binder and they can execute the the, the Jupyter notebook themselves. So okay. So this seems to be a bit slow <laughs> for a Sunday. Maybe you can show them my binder homepage. Um. Yeah. Oh, is it the internet? All right, so, no. Okay, so this is a home page of Binder. So, you so all it takes in is your GitHub repo. Um, you can test it out on branches as well. And as long as in your GitHub repo, you have a requirements.txt file, which has all of your Python packages that you want installed in it, then it will build you this notebook environment that will run with all of its dependencies. Is anyone? got the notebook to launch yet or is everyone it's launched yeah good oh, good no, so it's just my way okay right. cool there is hope oh, of course sorry yeah of course so it's uh is it this one it's the same yeah yeah sorry So 
I'll just give it a minute. Is that an error message chuckle or a... Oh, really? Oh. Right, okay. I, so this is the problem with doing things online, right? <laughs> yeah, so many things can fail. So, I mean, we can, do you want us to, we can actually show the notebook locally. All right, so mine is working. Perhaps if you can retry. Uh, just had bad luck, I'm sorry. Right, so this is basically, well, well other people wait, I can just explain a little bit about the, the notebook. So basically, uh, you have two main types of cells. So we have the markdown cells, where you just write explanations for your code, comments, etc. And all of this is, uh, you can edit, you know, you just double click and you can edit. Then you have the code cells. And these ones, if you press shift and enter, you just execute the code cell. And Jupyter has a model where it keeps things in memory. So let's say if you import some Python modules in this cell, then you can just you know, keep on going and running some other bits of the code without having to do the importing again. So, you know, it'll just work with this portion of your code, All right? So that's the main uh, interface we're gonna be using, which is going to the code cells, doing shift enter, running them. And obviously the advantage is if you want to change something on the cell, try it for yourself. Let's say I, I suggest running something here with a value. If you want to try yourselves with a different value, just write another value and see what happens, right? So that's that's the advantage of it. Okay. So this first cell here is um, importing the Spark libraries that we need, getting Spark set up, and setting us up a Spark session. So this is straight standard, kind of copied from a, how to get started with Spark in Python. Um, Session. So, as Rui said, if we want to execute the cell, which we'll need to in order to set up the Spark session, we have to click Shift and Enter. So, when we do that, what you see is you'll see a star in the square brackets on the left. That means that the cell is executing. And once it turns to a number, that means it's done. So, we've now run that cell and we're in business. So, we're now able to load in the data set. So, do you want to talk about that? Yeah. So... As Sophie said, the data set comes from VLANs and they have several uh, files as uh, comma-separated value files. And the main thing we're interested in is, is a ratings uh, file. And the ratings file is just a file that contains a unique user ID as an integer, a unique movie ID, and an actual rating. So basically saying user X gave movie Y the rating 3.5 or whatever. And we have a secondary file which, in which we're interested, which is a movies data file. And that just contains the link between the, the movie ID and the actual title of the movie, because sometimes we want to see what, what the actual movie is. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to use this function. We created, as Sophie said, a Spark session. So a Spark session is your connection to the Spark cluster, right? And Spark is a MapReduce framework that does distributed computing in memory. So basically what it does is you load the data into Spark. Obviously, you're running Spark here locally, but ideally, in the real world, you run Spark on a cluster, right? So you have like a Spark node on each, on each computer. And what Spark does is it loads the data, splits it into uh, what it calls resilient distributed data set. You can imagine just as a big array, right? Distributes them over the cluster. And then you can transparently map functions to those uh, arrays, right? So let's say you have a major array with all the numbers from one to 10 to the power uh, 1,000, right? So Spark will just distribute those numbers randomly, perhaps, through the, the nodes. And if you wanted to square those numbers, what what uh, Spark would do was just pass the, s the function that squares something to all those nodes, and then it would execute locally in memory that function, and then you, know, you have all the numbers squared. So that's where you distribute uh, computations on Spark in, in a very simplified view, obviously. Uh, so you have this function. The first question is, how do you get data into Spark, right? So you have this function called text file, given the Spark context, right, which is your point of entry for Spark. And basically what it does is it reads a file into Spark. That's all it does, right? So here we have a simple function called world data. What it does is it takes uh, uh, the, the path for a CSV file, right? It loads it into Spark, 
And then you see here, you can already start applying the functions to those RDDs which are distributed over the, the, the cluster, right? So the first, thing, the first thing we do is we filter out all the fields that correspond to the header, right? Because we have a CSV file, it has a header, so we want to strip it. But remember, these RDDs are distributed, so you can't say take out the first element because Spark would say, well, where is the first element, right? This is all shuffled and distributed. So you take something that is equal to the header, take it out, and then you split all the strings on the CSV file where a comma is, right? It's pretty much standard CSV processing if you do it manually. And then you map a function that just takes like the first item or the second item, etc., right? And then you create something which is a data frame. And data frames in Spark are pretty much like data frames in other languages like R or Pandas or something like that, but they are distributed, right? And the advantage is that you can run SQL type queries on those data frames, distributed, right? So if you want to do something like uh, distinct count or whatever, you can do that on a massive data set which is distributed, it's kind of a distributed database as well. Right, so first step, we load the movies uh, CSV, we say strip out the line that's, that's equal to this, right? And then create a row with the first item and the second item, right? And the same for the ratings. Strip out the line that contains this and then take out those items. And then we have our, our data set. Let's execute this. Right. Is everyone that's trying to run it okay, running on binder or, yeah? Okay, so it's done. Obviously, since this slide is just for illustration purposes and, and explaining, we're running Spark locally, which, you know, you might seem a bit redundant, so, but, but it works. What we're doing is we're running Spark on the same machine that we're doing the tests, and it's just one node, but, you know, it works, so it, it works to show what Spark can do. So now we're going to do, like, the first thing. We're going to see how many movies we have, how many ratings we have, and how many users we have, and we use the count function for that. And here you can see the SQL type uh, constructs, right? So you see from the ratings data set, select the column user, take out just the distinct users, and then count them, right? So, okay, so here you have the first result. So you have this amount of movies, this amount of ratings, and this amount of users, right? And this is just like an example. This is a function very common for data frames. It's just take something which means that it takes five elements from, the, from that data frame and shows them on, on the screen. So it just prints them. Okay, so we have, you can see the, the format. Yeah. The question is, um, when you have here create data frame, is this lazy or will it load everything into memory that there is and then distribute it? That's a very good question. So, so ideally it should be lazy. So, uh, okay, so the question was if, if the, um, if when you create the data frame, you should a command to create the data frame, if that's a lazy uh, operation or, or if it does it immediately, if it all splits the data and creates the data frame in memory. So you can specify actually the laziness level. So, you know, I, I think by default it's lazy. So only if you do operation, th that's, that's good in a way for performance reasons, but if you have problems on your code, it can be very annoying because, you know, just <laughs> when something is executed very, you know, in the branch that, that you, <coughs> you're not expecting, you're gonna get an error or something. <coughs> Sorry. Okay. So. So what what would happen if we change the number after take? Oh, sorry. Yeah. So you mean if we put it yeah, here? Yeah. So yeah. an example of just editing a notebook. Yeah. Why can't we see all of that shell? <coughs> yeah, it's just so the annoying scroll bar. So the take button to the take number to ten, for example, and then the output. Again, it's going to count the number of movies, the number of users, which will remain the same. And now we see 10 films. Okay. Right. So the first question is, well, how, how is this? Did you want to talk about the, how, is, how, is, uh, how does the, this data set look like? Right? So apparently, this is like a very good data set. It's very common in research for re recommendation engines. It's a very standard data set. But let's look at how it looks. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at the distribution of ratings. Right? So what do we have? Well, what do people rate uh, more? What do people give more as a rating? So you can see, okay, it's not uniform. That's good, right? We're expecting to see something like this. So the most common rating is four stars, which is a bit surprising. So people give lots of four stars. Then they give three stars, then they give three and a half. Okay. 
okay, it's, it's, it's sensible, right? It, it corresponds to something you might expect to see. And this is another advantage of Jupyter Notebooks. If you want to do interactive and prototyping data science, you can have quick feedback visually, so you can plot something very easily. You're using a, a library for Python called Seaborn, which is a, a wrapper around matplotlib, which is a kind of default library for plotting in, in, in data science in Python. And it has very simplified commands. One of them is this plot. It just shows a, an histogram of the data, right? So, okay. So let's try to explore the data a little bit more. So the second question is, do users give uh, all the same amount of ratings? Like do, if you have uh, 10,000 ratings, does that mean that 1,000 users gave 10 ratings each? Or do you have users that give lots of ratings and some that give few? I mean, we know intuitively they should give different amounts of ratings, right? So here we use some more SQL type of operations. We, we aggregate by user, we count the numbers of ratings that they gave, and we look at the distribution. And okay, we see, okay, this is sensible as well. So we see that many users, like the majority, gives very few ratings, right? They just rate a few movies they like a lot. And, but then you have like the super users. You see the people that actually live for, to give ratings, right? And, and they, they have like 2,500 ratings. So, so, you know, these are people that basically are constantly rating things. But just looking at the Instagram is, I mean, it's hard to see how many of them are, right? So let's just actually count them. So how many super users do we have? Like how many people give more than 1,500 ratings? We suspect it shouldn't be a lot, right? So it's actually four. Okay, that's good. So it's just four people actually really love giving ratings to movies. And how many do we have which give less than 200 ratings? That's a lot, right? It should be the majority, yeah. So almost 500 people. Okay, so just finally to finalize the data exploration, what about movies? Do movies have all the same amount of ratings? I mean, we shouldn't expect, right? Like a very popular movie should have lots of ratings and a very obscure movie should have few. So we should see something similar to the ratings per user. Yeah, and that's it. You see, like, majority of movies has just uh, a few ratings. They're probably very w not well known, and some movies have lots of ratings. Okay, so. Okay, so this is another count. Fun fact: If you were actually going to watch fifteen thousand movies and one thousand five hundred movies, and they were each ninety minutes in length. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Fun fact, take two. If you were going to watch 15, uh, 1,500 movies and they were 90 minutes in length, you'd spend 93 days watching films. I think that's something we can all aspire to. <laughs> super users. <laughs> all right, so, yeah, super users. Okay, so now quickly, the, the, the thing I think most people want to hear about. What, what are recommendation engines and what do they do? So you have lots of types of recommendation engines. You have knowledge-based recommendation engines. You have uh, several types of approaches to the problem. But the one we're going to talk about today is called collaborative filtering. And it's a pretty uh, established and standard way of doing recommendation engines. And basically, how do... Uh, how does collaborative filtering work? So collaborative filtering, basically, you use it every day in a common sense way and probably don't even think about it. So collaborative filtering works by, creating by finding affinities between groups of users and saying, well, if these users like something similar, then it's probably that they're going to agree on something that they don't know. So I'll, I'll give you an example. So let's say you have two groups of friends, right? And one of them, group one, they, they have very similar music tastes to you, right? So they like all the things that you do. And group two is a group of friends that everything that they like, you hate. So every music they listen to, you hate. So if group one recommends you an album, oh, you should really listen to this, and group two recommends you an album, you should really listen to this, which one are you going to choose? Right, okay, so that's, right, that's common sense, right? Okay, so, so this is collaborative filtering in a way, right? So we try to find affinities between users, and if those users like something that you don't know, then it's very likely that you're going to like it as well. Just as a bonus question, if group two doesn't like something, does that mean you're not going to like it as well? No. Yeah, no. You, got, you don't know. Because, you, you know, you don't have like a positive correlation, you don't have a relation between the information, so you, you can't really say for, su for sure, so yeah. So it only works if people agree with something. 
So how does this work? This works by pairing three quantities, right? So all you need is a user product and a rating, right? And users, <coughs> sorry, for the algorithm to work, users, they, they have to be, have a unique ID, an integer ID, and products must have a unique integer ID as well. And ratings could be anything as long as it's numerical. So, you know, it could be, uh, you don't have to have a scale, obviously, you know, it doesn't have to be zero to five stars or whatever. It could be any number, basically. So, so how does this work? So basically, the way this works is we build a matrix, which is called a ratings matrix, right? And on one side, see the, 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 the columns, you put all the users, orders, right? And on the rows, you put all the products. So you build uh, a matrix of the ratings you have. So user two liked product, gave product one, 45, et cetera. Obviously, some of these, most of these entries will be empty because you don't know. If you knew, you wouldn't need a recommendation engine. So you don't know. So the way this, the algorithm works, the most uh, typical implementation of, co of collaborative filtering, which is alternating with squares, works by factorizing that ratings matrix into two latent factors matrix, matrices, so U and P. And what this does is, so these are all your ratings, right? And these are the factorizations. That means that that matrix multiplied by this one is going to give this. And if you... Um, if you establish those factors, right, when you multiply them together, you're going to have all the entries filled at, with an approximation, right? Because it's gonna, they're going to be filled with the values that maximize the closeness of one matrix to another. So that basically means that those numbers that you didn't have are going to be predictions, right? So you can say, if user 3 didn't see product 1, but the value of that three to one that makes the matrix more close to the original one when you multiply it back is 3.8, right? So this is a, a classic, uh, it's a classic uh, least squares problem, right? Where you just iterate until you solve the, the matrix problem with a loss function, right? Okay. Yeah, so we're trying to, I think I've got a different version of the presentation running to you. So okay. we're trying to... Um, I can show you, sorry. Do you just want to refresh, see if it works? So we're trying to uh, find the most fact of matrices U and P such that when you multiply them back together, the ratings that a user had already given are as near as possible to what was initially there. So when you multiply the first row and the first column, you want to get what the first user actually rated that film on the ratings that they did give. And as a result, we do get those filled in missing values. Um, something that's really nice about the user factors and the product factors, so you can associate the first row of that user matrix with user one. And that tells you something about user one. Now, the factors that are in that aren't a traditional feature vector in the machine learning sense. I couldn't tell you what the first one means or what the second one means or what the third one means. But what you could do is perhaps look at the difference between two users by comparing their vectors. So you get some sense of distance between the users. So they're two numeric vectors. You could take the mean squared error between those two vectors, compare them, see how different they are. And if that number is smaller than a different two users, then you know that your first two users were more similar than your second, relatively. Similarly, you can make comparisons about the films um, in exactly the same way. So the different rows of that vector, or the columns in this sense, because we've turned it on its side of that vector P, each correspond to a product. In this case, it's films. And so we can compare those in the same way. Yeah? Okay. So we're going to, um, in order to train a model, what we do is we take our ratings matrix R and we take 60% of it as training data. So we're going to use that to learn those vectors U and P. They're what we're aiming to learn. Once we've got those, we can make ratings. But in order to 
determine how good our vectors U and P are, we want to test it on a validation set. So if we just tested how good it was on the training set, it's likely that you get a wonderful result on the training set. It's what we call overfitting, so it fits the training set perfectly. And when you actually go to make a prediction for a different user that wasn't in your training set, your results are terrible. So your model is what we call overfit. So by keeping that validation set and evaluating the model on that validation set, we can determine in a more robust way how good the model is. And we're just determining this through mean squared error. So the ratings in our validation set, we say what rating did user I give product J and what does our matrix predict user I would give product J and we compute the mean squared error. So that's the squared difference between the prediction and the truth. So if we transfer over to the notebook, then we can uh, see a quick <coughs> example of computing the mean squared error. So in there, it explains the mean squared error itself. And we've got two vectors here. So you could imagine, like I was saying, that these represent two users for example, and so if we execute this cell with shift and enter, you can see the star shows it's running and then it turns into number 11, so we know that it's ran. And then we've got a function here to compute the mean squared error. So what it's doing is that it is zipping up two vectors, so it takes in two values, it zips them, it effectively combines them into you can, I think of it as a table together, so they're now in pairs. And then we say for each item, each pair in this zipped up data frame, we take the first, which is, we can think of as the truth. We take the second, which we can suppose is that prediction. We square the difference, and then we scale by the length. And so you can see here the mean squared error for that vector is 0.13. So that's just a... illustrative example, and we'll use that later when we train a model and we evaluate the model. So the ALS model has a few different parameters. We've talked about this, um, the feature vectors U and P, and one thing that the user gets to tune is how many rows or columns there are in U or P, how big it is. Um, so we'll be tuning for that later, and that's called the rank. Rui, do you want to talk about the cold start strategy yep. um, so, yeah. parameter? Yeah. So, I mean, as Sophie explained, I mean, explain how the mean square there, what it's trying to measure, and I talk a bit about the latent factors, and you always have talked about the rank as well. So, as, as I said, our objective is to try to find out those two uh, factors, right? That, that's how alternate least squares work. But the thing is, how this works is solving uh, a least squares problem by keeping one of them fixed and solving a linear system of equations for that one, and then alternating. So it fixes that one and solves in order this one, and it just goes back and forth until it converges in a solution, right? The problem is, how is that solution, when is it good enough? Right, so I mean, when, when should it stop? Ideally, you could just say it will run forever, right? But you don't want that. So you have some some uh, parameters on Spark's ALS. Spark has an in, inbuilt uh, implementation of ALS. It allows you to to work with that. But when you're doing this approximation, you might get uh, non-numerical values on on the solutions, right? If if one of the matrix is singular, so you have that option called cold start strategy drop that just drops values which are NA from from the matrices, right? So it does, doesn't take them into account. Um, so Sophie talk, talked about the rank, which means when we're solving for these equations, we need to say how wide they are, so how many columns or how many rows they have, and that's a rank. We don't know what the rank is, right? I mean, how do we know? It could be three, it could be 100. Obviously, it stands to reason that if you choose, say, a rank of 100, you're gonna have like a, a big matrix and a big matrix, when you're going to multiply them, it's going to be slower, so it's going to take longer to solve, right? Yeah. Do you want to? Yeah. And it's also going to overfit much worse if you have the too, too high rank, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Right. yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because, yeah, and uh, so Sophie's going to talk about, in a minute, about uh, lambda, the, the requisition parameter. 
Yeah. Yeah, which deals with double shooting. Yeah, so uh, max iterations is just the maximum number of times that it iterates between optimizing for those matrices U and P. So fix U, optimize for P, fix P, optimize for U. And then, yeah, we've mentioned overfitting a few times. And if this was my data and I wanted to fit a model to that data, then the model which would minimize mean squared error would be a zigzag line that went through all of these points. Because at the points values, our model fits perfectly. But I think you would all agree that perhaps what we would prefer would be something more like a linear line, a straight line. We could argue about whether or not that's a good fit later, but you can see that it kind of catches what's happening in the data. And that is what we need in order to make good predictions. We don't want to overfit. So the reg regularization parameter just prevents overfitting. You'll see those in most, um, in all, hopefully, uh, machine learning algorithms. Otherwise, you're going to have a problem when you put it into production or try to make predictions on data that you haven't yet seen. So let's flip back to the notebook and actually start running these models, tuning parameters, and getting going. Right. You want to talk about them? Yeah. Yeah. So if my model overfits, obviously, am I going to increase the regularization or decrease the rank or both? We, we're going to go into so that. what's the best way of estimating the parameters. I mean, you, you have some standard ways of determining the best parameters. And, and we're just going to go through that in a second. Yeah. I would it's a good question. But oh, sorry, the question was uh, how, how do you, if, if your model is overfitting, how do you choose the proper, if you wanted to change something like the, the lambda or the rank, how, you know, how do you change it? Do you shrink it? Do you make it bigger? And the question is there's a standard way of testing what's the actual proper value to, to, put, to put there, right? It just depends how much time and competition time you have. Yeah. So, but yeah, that's the proper way of doing it. In general, I would say that you want to, ch if, you're, if you know your model is overfit, you want to tune the regularization parameter rather than the rank, but it's really important. It's a really, I hadn't considered really that the rank would lead to overfitting, so that is a very good point. We'll see later. <laughs> we'll see in a second. So, okay, the first thing we mentioned is uh, we should split the data, right? Because we don't want to obviously do the, we don't want to calculate how good our model is on the same data that we trained it, because uh, <laughs> the answer might be it's very good, and it's not actually. So what we do is we split the data, and as, as you remember, Spark splits all the data through innumerable uh, nodes on the cluster. So how do you split data that's, you know, split in a thousand different computers. Okay, fortunately, Spark has a function that deals with that and it's called random split. And the thing that you do is just, you pass it proportions, right? So you say you want to split it into three, you give it three proportions that hopefully add up to one and each one presents a percentage, right? So here you're gonna split the data set into 63% on one side, 18 on the other, 18 for the other one, right? So it's good, it's like a handy thing, you don't need to think how Spark does it and it just does it. So we've split into three here with the view that we're going to retain one of those three chunks and use it for uh, continuous. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we've split into three here because uh, we we're going to use that third set. So in the slide I showed that we just split into two: one for testing, one for um, training. But actually, we're going to retain a third set that we'll use to uh, iteratively check how well our model is performing when we put it into production. So we want to keep that third set back that we can use in the production case. Talk about the training, or yeah, I, yeah, I think we can keep going with the slides. The, with the it? sorry, with the notebook, you can go. Okay, so. Uh, uh, sorry, as we said, uh, Spark provides uh, out-of-the-shelf uh, implementation of ALS. That's quite good because 
ALS is actually trivial to implement locally on a single machine, but as with anything else, I'm sure you guys have experience with it, as soon as you try to distribute it, it it's a big headache, right? I mean, distributed uh, computing is not simple. So Spark has a quite good, it's a very good implementation, right? It's actually very clever. It does thing like things like trying to find affinity between user vectors to keep them close in the cluster, right? So it minimizes the shuffling of data between nodes. Uh, so, so it's quite good. And, and it's very simple to, to do recommendations with Spark. So they have a class called ALS. And you just needed to pass these parameters if you want. Many of them have defaults, right? So, I mean, all of them have defaults. So here we're going to instantiate an ALS class with maximum number of iterations, five, regularization parameter or the lambda 0 0.01, rank three, remember that's the number of columns or rows on the UNP, uh, and call strategy drop, right? And if you notice, we don't pass any data. We just instantiate the class. Okay, and now Spark has a, a method called fit in which you actually pass data to it and it, it will train the ALS model, right? And that's all you need to train an ALS model. So you just have the model we created, simple ALS, fit with a training data set. And that's it. Okay, it should take like a few seconds. 10, 20 at most, <laughs> okay. Uh, so that's it. I mean, with eight seconds, you have a AOS model ready to do predictions trained on a distributed cluster in eight seconds. You didn't have to do much. That's quite good. But, I mean, this is not something you do in production, right? I mean, where, where does the five, the 0 0.01 and the three come from? This is completely arbitrary, right? It's completely made up. You have no, assurance that these are the best values. So we're going to go into that in, in a second. So Spark has two more uh, classes I wanted to talk to you about. One is called the regression evaluator, since AOS is actually a, a regression in some ways, which you instantiate by passing it uh, error measure, in our, in our case mean squared error. What's the actual column of the data frame that contains the source of the, data, the true value, the truth? and the prediction column, so the name of the column that contains the prediction, right? So this could be anything, could be like height <coughs> and predicted height, or you know, like price of the house, true price of the house and predicted price of the house, could be anything, and which metric you want to use. So we just instantiate this, and this calculates the MSC, and it has a, a second method on the model, which is called transform. And this method does the predictions, right? So what it does is you pass it, uh, a data frame with users and movie IDs, and it's going to predict with your model what the ratings for the users and movies is going to be, right? So if you run it, we're going to have, we're going to make predictions with our model, right, with a test data set, and we're going to use the evaluator to calculate the mean squared error. Okay, it should be seconds as well. Okay, so we have this mean squared error. This means that, as the name implies mean squared error, means that on average the squared error between the true rating and the predicted rating is this value, right? Which is a bit big, right? I mean, it's, it could be <laughs> much better, obviously. So, usually a sanity test that people do when they have a model is how better would this how, how better is this model than just using, say, the average rating, right? So if all the ratings were the average, the prediction was the, the average rating, how better would the, the, the mean squared error from our model be than that model, which is obviously a very bad model. So we can do that. So we use, as you see again, the SQL type constructors of data frames. So what you're doing here is just like SQL to calculate the mean rating, right? So you just do group by mean of the column rating, then we collect the value. Oh, by the way, collect means on Spark, all your data is distributed, but if you want to call it to your own node, you do a collect, right? So you just actually like fetching the value from the nodes. And we see, well, that's the that's mean rating, right? That's the mean rating that people gave. And now we do, we create a data frame. 
with that mean value. So we, this is kind of faking a, a model that predicts always the same, the same value. And we calculate the mean squared error of this bad model. Right. Okay, so is it, this is it, right? Okay, so it was 1.08 something. Okay, so it's, it's worse than our model. It means our model is, be is better, but not that much better. But it's better, all right, so it's good, right? It's slightly better, <laughs> yeah, that's an improvement. Okay, but I mean, the question is now, obviously, how do we know which parameters should we use to make the model, right? Do um, you wanna do this, Sophie, or do you want me to? Um, no, you can go. I think we can yeah, just carry on through the notebook. You wanna go? Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I mean, <laughs> okay, so, so I'm just quickly going to talk about parameter estimation. So the most uh, typical way of doing this is since you have a way of calculating how good our model is, which is a mean squared error or any error measure, measure uh, we use a kind of brute force technique. And what that is, is you take all the parameters you want to estimate for and you make a grid of those parameters with a range of possible values, right? So say, I want to test all the ranks from 1 to 10. I want to test all the lambdas from 0 0.01 to 2.0 with an interval, with a step of certain value, right? And with those values, you create a, a grid, and all the combinations of values are going to be tested by Spark, right? And in the end, it's going to say, from all these combinations of, of values, the one that actually gives you the lowest mean squared error is this one, okay? And that way, you you can say from the options that I gave to Spark, this is the best model. Like, these are the best parameters I can use, right? So there are a few methods that help you with that, but also keep in mind, this has a few problems. Well, one of them is that it's, it's expensive computationally. So, you know, if you obviously you want to test for the biggest amount of parameters you can, but that takes time, right? Here the model is quite simple, it just takes eight seconds, but you can imagine that the parameter grid grows exponentially, Right. I mean, if you had one parameter and you already have like a hundred, you're gonna add a hundred more tests, right? So Sorry. it takes it takes a long it takes a long time, and and it's a brute force method, right? So I mean, you you might be missing something out if you don't test all the parameters. So we can try to do that anyway. So this is a class on Spark that helps you build the parameter grid. So it's called Param Grid Builder. And you basically just add a grid for each of the uh, parameters you want to test and the range you want to test. So in this case, because I don't want you guys to be here for like five days or something, uh, I just we just gave them like two two options, right? Two for the rank and two for the max iteration. Again, it's better than not having any kind of parameter estimation, but it's still a bit arbitrary, right? I mean, why would I choose six and eight, or why would I choose ten and twelve? So what uh, is uh, the step between 6 and 8? You can go uh, with step 1, 6, 7, 8, yeah. or uh, 1, 10. How does it know which is the step? You, you actually pass the, the actual parameters you want to take. So in this case, you're just passing a list with two numbers, mm -hmm. right? So it's just going to test for 6 and 8. Mm -hmm. It's not a range. In Python, you have... Uh, um, I'm sorry, I don't, know if you're, I don't remember if you said you had experience with Python or not. <laughs> okay. So in Python, you have, you have a method called range, which, which gives you like a range, and you can specify the step. So if you, if you wanted to do this, and you had the time, and you want to say, I want to test all the numbers from 0 to 10, you could write, for instance, the same thing, and here you put like range 10. Yeah, yeah, and give us 10. Yeah, or if you want to write 1,000, you could put 1,000, right? Okay. So the rank is always an integer. It doesn't make sense to use a step of 0.5. Yeah. 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 yeah, but but for yeah, true. But if you had like the lambda, for instance, then you could you know you could put. But yeah, that's that's the idea. So in this case, you're just passing the actual numbers. So max iterations, was, which is the number of times that we iterate between the optimization steps, is a parameter which. Um, 
the bigger you have max iterations, the better your results are going to be. They're never going to get worse if you run your optimization step for longer. However, the longer you run your optimization step, the longer it takes. So in general, what we found when we were working on this in practice and trying to tune for maximum iterations was that there wasn't really any point because we knew that if you picked a bigger number, it would get better. It was all just a matter of time and how long we had. And we actually found that in general, the model converges pretty well after 10 iterations, even on the large data set. So after that, there's only a negligible improvement in mean squared error. You could use a more clever metric to select a mean squared error, uh, sorry, to select the parameter value for maximum iterations. So something you could do is say, compare the mean squared error for a model with iterations 10 and iterations 11. If the mean squared error only differs by, has only improved by a negligible amount, which you have to define yourself, then we stop. We're going to use that value of maximum iterations. But in this case, we are just looking at mean squared error. So it took about 1 minute 6 seconds to run on the grid of these four parameter values. Um, whilst on binder, it would be quicker if you were just running it locally. And what we can do there is ask the model to print out the best rank. So it tells us that the best rank in this case out of 6 and 8 was 6. And unsurprisingly, the best iterations out of 10 and 12 was 12 because the longer you run it, the better. OK, so we've trained a model. We talked about parameter estimation. And what we really need to do now is make some predictions. So in order to make predictions, we're again using this transform function, which just takes in oh, 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 our test set. And uh, then the code below is just amending the format so that it looks nice, so we get ourselves a nice table. So what we're seeing here is the user ID the title of the film, um, and the predicted value. And we've also appended here the true rating that the user gave. So you can see here um, how simple it is to make and get <coughs> predictions. You want to go? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so as, as Sophie mentioned, so we, we to do the predictions, we just use this transform method, so it's quite simple, and, and we pass it a, a, a data frame, right, containing user IDs and movie IDs, and you get this prediction. So if you look at it, even with our model, which didn't train for that long, it didn't exhaust the number of parameters to choose, you do get some good predictions, but you do get some really bad ones as well, right? But, but you can see, I mean, some of them are quite okay. They're close to the true value. If, if, you know, if you wanted to know just if someone liked or hated a movie, th this would be, give a good idea. But some of them are quite bad. But if you want to quantify how bad they are, that's another advantage of Jupyter Notebooks. We can quickly have like visualization. So let's calculate the errors, so the difference between the prediction and the true value, and, and plot the distribution. Right? And you get something like this. Sorry, I don't think I executed this. So when you first open your Jupyter Notebook, if you had previously executed the cells, which we had during a different session when we were practicing, you can see that the results are already in there, but nothing is formally loaded. So in order to get access to the items in the cells, we're having to rerun them. Yeah, yeah, so these are just artifacts from previous runs. Uh, if you want, like if you want to, do the proper way. You can just go to kernel. Don't don't do it now, please. <laughs> but you can go to kernel and you restart and clear output, and it just restarts the kernel and cleans all the results. Uh, so okay, so this is an error distribution, and you can see, well, it's not that bad, right? I mean, the majority of errors are you know pushing co towards zero, or you know at one you just have like a few of them, and you know it's very rare to have like big errors. So even even we didn't have like that much data, and and the training was a bit you know doing on the knee. It's it's okay, not that bad. So you know it's good if you want to just show your friends or ask them which kind of movies they like, you can use it probably. Uh, but and let's calculate then the mean squared error of this model. 
So we had like 1.0 zero something for the other one, right? We so had 1.08 when we just used the, when right. we returned to every user the average rating right. from all of the scores. And we had 1.02 when right. we used our initial basic model that yeah. was just trained at two random values that we picked. So I think that was iterations five and rank of three. Um, and we can see that now we're making some sort of mean squared error improvement. Right. So, I mean, you, you can see here that it's not excellent, it's not the best thing in the world, but it's a, a clear improvement to the previous one, where it's just, because it's exactly the same model as before, the, uh, I mean, it's exactly the same data set as before, you just change the parameters a little bit. And you can see the difference it made. It's much better if you actually try, and, and we just tried two options, right? Six, eight, 10, 12. So you can imagine if you train for a big range, probably somewhere in there, you would have like the, the real good parameters that will give you a very nice mean squared error. So, you know, this is like the crucial point. Always, you have to estimate your parameters, obviously. Don't, don't do it because someone told you that this rank is good or that parameter lambda is good. That doesn't mean anything. You, you really have to test it on your data, on your, on your model. So, what good is a model like this if what do we want it for? So, now that we have a trained model, we want to do predictions, right? I mean, probably if you're now considering using this on production, say you have, I mean, you're working on an online bookstore, you know, the classical examples, and you want to recommend books to people, you want to do predictions, right? And Spark allows you to, gives you facilities to do all these things out of the box as well. So, you have some inbuilt functions that give you all the recommendations. So the first one is called, for instance, recommend for all users. And it gives you a top K recommendation. What that means is, if you choose uh, K equals 10, say, then it's gonna give you the top 10 movies for each user, right? And that's quite useful. And you're doing this on a distributed way, right? So you're gonna get a result quite, uh, quite quickly, even on a big data set. So this is giving, you know, for user 471, it's giving like the top 10 movies for him. That's quite good because that's what you expect him to serve on a system like that, right? You want the people to go on their profile page and see, oh, these are the best 10 books or movies for you, etc. It gives you the, the reverse, so it gives you the top 10 uh, users for each movie as well, right? So you can just recommend for all items, so you, you execute this and it just gives you which are for each, uh, for each movie, which are the 10 people that are most likely to like that product, right? Okay, so you can give it ad hoc predictions as well. So the only thing you need to do is construct a data frame. And constructing a data frame on, on Spark, as you saw, is very easy. So you, you just need to instantiate a list of rows, and then Spark has that create data frame helper function that gives you a data frame back. So here we, we're putting pairs in the, in the user item format. So you say, we want to know the rating for user 233 and item 901, et cetera. So you just create a data frame with that. And as before, you know, we're gonna use the transform method to uh, create the predictions from the model. And there you go. You have the predictions for those three users and three movies. The ratings they should give you to them. Okay, so you see, it's quite, it's quite straightforward to do it. So, do you want, yeah. do you want to? Yeah, sure. Yeah? So everything we've talked about so far has been pretty general and pretty abstract. We're telling you that we've trained a model and built it and it's making decent predictions and the mean squared error is getting better. But you've sort of got no reason to believe that. I mean, you shouldn't trust us at this point. So whenever you're doing a machine learning method, it's often good to just take a step back and say, is this giving sensible predictions, right? Is this doing what I expect it to for some data that I know about? It's very easy to just optimize for mean squared error and say, oh, well, the mean squared error is fine, so our model is fine, let's ship it, put it into production, and actually your results may not be so good. So what we're doing in this section of the notebook is making personal recommendations for ourselves. Now, uh, what we're doing first in this first cell is making ourselves a new user ID. So we're saying what's the maximum user ID that exists in the set of user IDs in our data set, and we're adding one to that. That's us now. So we are user 611. 
Rui's written this lovely little function here, which is able to find movies that have a particular word in. So I want to make predictions. So say, OK, I want to make a prediction on, uh, I can't think of any films right now. Someone give me a film. Campbell. Oh. <laughs> I, uh, yes, my favorite. <laughs> Okay, so we can type Rambo into there and we can see. <laughs> Typo. Never trust your data. Okay, so we can see here these item IDs. So it's given us the item IDs for the film. So what I can do now is say that as user number 611, we'll deal with the user. I, I adore it so much. Which is the original? It's the first one. I don't know, don't look at me. 2403, two, four, okay? And I love it so much, I'm going to give it five stars. So, you can go through and do this for yourself. You can see how simple it is to get the films and. So, I mean, the idea was which one is here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're Mr. Karma. The idea was which one you want to try to do. I don't think we have time for it. Yeah, so. so you can go through and you can see that you can rate films. So this is actually Rui's rating, surprisingly enough. And it's a good mix of, I don't know what type of films these are, action films, more action films. It's Rambo. Rambo. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so what we've done here is we've created a Spark data frame. We've put our user ID in, which is 611. And then we've got our item as an integer and our rating as an integer. So you can see this table here. What we're going to do is we're going to join this to all of the other ratings because we want to train the model again and we want to include the ratings that I've just made. You know, I want the model to learn about me and be able to make predictions for me. So I've appended those. And yes, sorry, sorry, can I just make a quick comment? Yeah, of course. So, uh, can you just go one cell down? Yeah, yeah. that's right. That's so then this is pretty straightforward to understand, right? So from the train model, which is the best model, and the rank, which is the best rank, but don't get scared, don't get scared by this, like Java object, parent, get. I mean, this, this is a problem with uh, Python Spark, because PySpark is actually communicating with Spark, which is written in Scala and Java, using Py4j. So, so, you know, the problem is some of these things on the API are not exposed on the Python side, so it has, has to access the underlying uh, Java connection directly. So don't, don't get scared. That's not a usual Spark API, right? You don't need to do that kind of weird incantations. Um, so yes, yeah, just a note on that. Okay. So we've retrained the model with that updated data that includes my fabulous film ratings. And what we are now doing here, we want to make predictions for me. And the predictions that I want to make are only for unseen movies, movies which I have not seen. I don't want a prediction for Rambo because I already know I love it. Thank you. So this gives us a set of unseen movies. So these are the item IDs. And it tells me there's 9,721 movies in that database that I have not seen. So in order to make predictions, I need to add together my, the item IDs that I haven't seen and my user ID. So that's what, what we're doing here, joining those up. And then we go on and use this transform function that we've seen before to make predictions from our new model. So the output is this when I ask it to give me 10. And that's not so useful because I don't know what our item IDs are. So in this little bit of code here, we are joining with the movies uh, um, data that we loaded in. And that movies data contains the names of the movies, which is what we want. So these are some predictions. The top 10, these are unordered. And um, I mean, I'm, arguably, it looks OK. Rui, do you like Dirty Dancing? Uh, no, I will give it a 1.9. Right. right, perfect. OK, but that is uh, just some anecdotal evidence. So let's go ahead and take a look at the best rated films for Rui and me with Rambo in there. OK, 
So there's a few things to call out here. But actually, why should they? It's like the, the French version of Twelve Monkeys, right? Before Twelve Monkeys. What was the movie that inspired Twelve Monkeys? That's very good spot, I mean. <laughs> just, just, can I just make a note, Sophie? Sorry, very, mm -hmm. very quick Go one. For it. So, I mean, if you're using Spark, uh, I mean, as, as I keep banging on about so I can distribute a computing framework. Um, just bear in mind that some of these operations, like joining and doing things like that, can be very expensive depending on your data, right? So if you have a large data set, it can be very expensive. If you imagine that all the data is distributed with possibly no uh, order that you can yourself understand, uh, if you're doing something like a sort, if you're asking, give me all the data back sorted, you're going to have lots of shuffling of data between nodes, right? So this is, I mean, obviously sometimes you have to do this, but it's just use it judiciously and, you know, be, just keep in mind that it can be very, very expensive. Sorry. No, that's a really good point. Um, so when we look at the predictions here, does anyone notice anything funny? I mean, not us. predictions which are more than five. Exactly. So all and of that. Quick, sorry, can I just, quick yeah, question for, for, for you. Oh, a prediction of six, is it like a prediction that you really like the movie? More than five? Or not? No, it means that something went wrong in the model. Right. So, I, I agree. So, if you imagine that earlier we saw a graph that looked something like this, and these were our original data sets, and then we fit a line to it, when we're seeing something like six, what is happening perhaps is that I've come along and my data sits here. So it's sort of outside of the domain of things that we've seen before. And as a result, when we read up off this line that we fitted, we hit something that is larger than anything that we've seen before. So that's where it's coming from. So we'd say that our model is extrapolating. It's making predictions outside of the range of things that it's seen before. Now, given that that is the data we have, and this is the, arguably the best model that we fit for our data, you, can, you could decide you wanted to discard that, or you could say, OK, well, that's, that's the best prediction we can make, but let's be cautious in this region. Um, so it did have me stumped for a long while when we were first getting predictions that were up at six. But, um, and an important point is that the, the error of a, of a rating, which is six, is obviously, since you're squaring it, it's going to be the absolute value. So it's going to be also, this is going to count as a bad prediction anyway. So That's right. So yeah. if we had rated that film and we'd rated yeah. it five, it was very good. And that was in our test set. It would give us an error of around one, which yeah. is and bad. It's a ty typical error of extrapolations. You know, it's like one person measuring one meter and a half enters the door, one person with two meters enters the door, you extrapolate to the next person, it's going to be two and a half meters, right? So, mm -hmm. so you know, that's a problem. Um, Has anybody heard of the majority of these films? The films in the list, the movies in the list. No? Any, any, anybody heard of any of them? I mean, Rui thinks he's heard of one of them. Um, maybe some, but yeah. not. Okay, so when we, at the start, we looked at some of the films that were in the data set and we saw something like Toy Story, right? Everyone heard of Toy Story? If you haven't, I'm sorry, you should. It's great. Um, so to me, this is a bit unusual. It's suggesting films that are pretty peculiar, okay? And there's a good reason for this. and. Although the model is working well, we haven't made an error, uh, we need to think about why this is happening, and we need to do something about it in what's called a post-processing step. So, if we go to post-processing. So you can imagine that uh, when we put something into production like this, it's got all of these components. So here we've set it up as a microservice type architecture um, with each component being standalone, but they communicate with the other microservices. And a post-processor would be something that comes after the model. So we make our model, we're happy with it, and then we put post-processing in. 
So one thing that you might post-process for in the film's case, so you can see the example we've done has been general. All we've had is user IDs and item IDs. We haven't anywhere used that these are films. This film's data set actually has tags with it. So each film has a tag that says this is an action, this is a romance, so on. And it may be that if I rate films, the majority of films that I'm rating are rom-coms or some terrible drama or some awful, awful movie with the tag hashtag awful movie. And so if I was going to put this into production, when I was going to make predictions for myself, I would probably look at those tags and more likely suggest to me rom-coms that were near the top of my list than some horror film because I haven't watched any horror films and I don't plan on starting now, right? That's kind of intuitive. So that would be something that you'd do in the post-processing stage. But what we want to do in the post pro Do you want to talk more about the post processing No, no, I'm just, you don't see the arrows. Oh, you can't <laughs> see the arrows. There's arrows between those services, but they don't show. They'll be in the slides. Um, so... Yeah, you, you can do many types of post-processing. Uh, I mean, just as, as an example, uh, let's try to do this, just to see what happens. Uh, let's try to remove all the movies that have more than 100 ratings, because they can have been having like a massive weight on your prediction since you, you did never give a rating to them. Let's just see what happens. It might be complete fewer nonsense. If you were. Okay. So, okay, so we have your account, and let's see it, what the prediction is now. So you can do this type of exploration, right? And Jupyter notebooks are, are excellent for this type of exploration because you can just rinse and repeat. You know, it's like a REPL with a nice uh, visualization uh, scheme, so so you can look at them. So okay, so this is the predictions. Let's just join them with uh, actual movie names and see if it makes more sense now. And if it does, since we're a bit pressed for time, I'll leave it as an exercise to you to think why it does make sense. Do you want to go through the implicit? Do you want to do yeah, streaming, we'll Gemini? Yeah, that all sounds it's just good. Okay, so when we remove films that had been rated by fewer than 100 people and then return the top predictions for Rui and Rambo, then these are the results that we're getting. Have people heard of these films? Yeah. Do these predictions look more in fitting with the ratings that Rui gave, I would argue yes. So again, this is just anecdotal and you should definitely go through and change those films for yourself and see what comes out. Yeah. Um, but it's always good to keep in mind that things can be done at the post-processing stage. It doesn't mean there's something wrong with your model. It just means that you need to inject a bit of extra information and you can do that quite simply whilst keeping your model the same. Yeah. Okay, so the film data that we talked about is. Can I do slides? Yeah, sure. Thanks. The film data that we talked about. Um, Uh, the film data that we talked about, so people have made explicit ratings about films. We went through and said, I rate this film 5 out of 10, I rate this film 0 out of 10, and so on. Now, in practice, we're getting lots of things recommended to us on a daily basis, just based on our interactions. So when you see ads on a web page, they're based on your interactions. You haven't explicitly gone to Google and said, hey Google, I love bikes, so show me adverts for bikes, please, right? It's just use your user profile and what we call implicit data to build a rating. So we're able to use ALS, alternating least squares, that same algorithm to make the recommendations in the case where the data is implicit. So I just want to motivate that a bit. And there's a section in the notebook where you can go through and play with implicit data. But I think we'll, we'll pass through. But please do have a look later if you want to and get in touch. So suppose I listen to a song and I listen to it once. What does that mean? Does it mean I like the song? No. Does it mean I dislike the song? No. No? I might not even have been listening. I might have had my headphones plugged into my computer and Spotify was just playing and I was off making a cup of tea, right? But I listened to it. Listened, in some sense. 
Okay, we've got ourselves another song. I haven't listened to it. Can someone tell me anything about it? You may or may not like it. I may or may not like it, right. So I might know that I dislike that band and therefore I have actively not listened to it. However, I may have just not listened because I hear there's quite a lot of songs in the world and I don't think I've listened to all of them. I might not know it exists. It could potentially be my next favorite song. We just don't know yet. I've listened to a song a hundred times. Yep, it's probably by Taylor Swift and I probably like it. Okay, so there's some information in there based on the number of times that I have played a song, but it's not like I like this 10 out of 10 or I don't. So how are we going to capture this in a model? Well, when we're in the implicit case, what we're trying to infer is a user preference. So we're saying, does user U like item I? And that's either a yes or no, our preference. So a zero is going to denote no, and a one is going to denote yes. So we're going for concrete. You like it or you don't. We're going to recommend it to you or we're not. The information we have, we're calling a recording, which is uh, Rui's name, and it's our rating R, uh, sorry, our recording R with subscript U and I. So the U is the user, the I is the item. And so in the songs case, our recording would be how many times you listen to the song. Okay, so for song A, my recording would be one, for song B, my recording would be zero. You could think of something else for the recording. So if we're thinking about TV programs, it might be, the recording might be the length of time for which you were watching that channel. You could collate multiple sources, sources of information. So it might have been the length of time you were watching that channel and the number of days that you watched that program could then be a multiplier to that and so on. So it's some user-defined recording. You're going to have to put your own instinct into this to decide what you want to set your recording as. And then we just set the preference to be one if the user has interacted with that item, if the recording is greater than zero, or a zero if the user has not interacted with that. Now, alarm bells should be ringing because what that means is I'm saying I positively like an item if I've listened to it once and I have no preference if I haven't listened to it. But we just motivated that there's different levels of liking. We have different sorts of confidence depending on how strong the recording is. So in order to capture this, we introduce a notion of confidence. So the confidence for user U and item I is 1 plus alpha, where alpha is some scaling parameter, times by our recording. So as the recording gets bigger, the confidence is going to get bigger. If the recording is 0, what value is the confidence going to take? One. 1. Perfect. So what we're saying is if the user hasn't interacted, we think they probably don't like it. They have, sorry, we think they probably don't have a preference and we have some confidence that they don't have a preference. So again, that's something that we could debate and argue over, but for now we're gonna stick with it. And then the algorithm is doing mean squares minimization. So we've got those user vectors, the item vectors like we had before. P is gonna be a preference, so it's our preference matrix. So this looks similar to the minimization we were doing before, but then you've got the confidence factor out front. I don't want to bore you with the maths. If anyone wants to hang out and discuss this further, get in touch. Um, so if we fling over to the notebook, there's an example in there that we won't stroll through fully, but it's using some library data. So there's an open source data set that will be loaded in if you use the notebook through Binder. And it says whether or not people interacted with a book, i.e. did they take it out from the library or did they not? And that's then used to make predictions. So the simple thing to point out is that we've loaded in the data, 
we can have a look at the data. So again, it's just of this form, user ID, item ID. So here the item IDs are the ISBNs of the books. Again, it's general, we're using books data, but it doesn't matter. You could stick any implicit data into the algorithm. And so the only thing I really want to point out is that the model looks very similar when we are building a model. Uh, can you find me the model building bit? <laughs> okay, so I'm looking for the bit where it says implicit. Is ah, okay, thanks, Ruby. So the cell is exactly the same as what we saw up top. We're doing some parameter tuning and you can run through this. Interesting to see how the parameters might vary on a different data set or in implicit. But everything is the same with the exception of this new um, option parameter, <laughs> implicit preferences, which is set equal to true. So this just illustrates how simple it is to amend things and use implicit ALS on Spark. So everything we've talked about so far has just been in a notebook and we've noted and discussed perhaps issues that you might have when you put this into production. And we've actually built a more robust system that runs outside of the notebook. So Rui, do you want to tell everybody about Rad Analytics? Yeah, so... Um Right. Okay, so um, Red Analytics is a community project and, and it tries to showcase the building of intelligent applications using uh, technologies such as OpenShift, which is, you know, I'm, I'm sure most of you are familiar with, or if not, at least Kubernetes you should be familiar with. And Spark as well in some cases, as in this case, the recommendation engines. And it shows lots of tutorials and, and use cases. And one of them is the, the Jiminy project. So the Jiminy project is basically, uh, sorry if I can find it here. All right, okay. So this is a kind of production ready uh, system built on microservices on uh, OpenShift using uh, uh, Spark, Apache Spark. So basically what it does is splits the, uh, an application, so it's a, a full application from consuming the data, having data stores, having a front end, having a model store, a, cache, a caching service, everything following microservice architecture. So you have some interesting things that you might look at to get ideas if you want. You can look at the code. Uh, for instance, some practical ways of solving problems like splitting the model prediction and the model building into two microservices. So you have something called a modeler, which is checking continuously the data store for changes. And if it finds a change, uh, it just triggers a model rebuild, right? And that model is serialized into a database and it can be retrieved by the predicting service, right? So you have a con continuously training uh, model building. So I encourage you to check it out if you want. It's, it's, I mean, if you want to look at the code of how something like this can be used uh, on a real application instead of a notebook just. So it's, it's, a, very, it's a very good example. Uh, you do have lots of other projects if you're interested in machine learning and uh, distributed machine learning, OpenShift. So I encourage you to check out the rest of the of the site. So and please give comments and PRs are always welcome. Uh, issues as well. PR is more welcome than issues. So <laughs> so yes, I mean, please please check it out. Um, Okay, so should I talk quickly about streaming data? Yeah, go for it. I mean, we have, uh, I think, a little while, and then people could ask questions. How are we for time? We have 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Oh, okay, that's good. So, yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, so, right, so now I just wanted to talk about, a little bit about streaming. Uh, ALS, right? So Spark provides batched ALS off the shelf, right? That's what you get with Spark. 
But the cool thing about Spark is that it's also a framework on which you can build your own algorithms, right? So you don't, you don't need, you're not restricted to what Spark gives you. And something you can build on Spark is uh, a way of training these models in a non-batch way. And that's very useful. So how, how does it work? I mean, if you recall, uh, what we did for batch was we had the ratings matrix, right? We wanted to calculate the latent factors. And if we had like a new rating, just a single one, and you wanted to retrain the model, then you would have to recalculate the whole process again. You have to recalculate the two matrices all over again, right? And this will be like an iterative process. So if you had, say, like 100 iterations, you'll be like calculating the factorization of that 100 times. This is all for just one rating. Like one person said, this book is really bad, and you have to retrain the whole thing. And you can think, well, this is kind of a waste, right? So it's bad. Probably I was within the end of the day, during the night or something. But what if there was a way of calculating those two factors without doing the whole thing? That would be really good, right? And it turns out that is. So we can do it using stochastic gradient descent. How do we do that? Well, I'm just going to give you like an overview of that. Previously, on the batch case, we had the predicted rating, right? And our loss function, what we were trying to minimize was the error square error given that predicted rating. So in streaming, in stochastic gradient descent uh, ALS, what you do is you add a bias term to this predicted rating, right? And the bias term is calculated with the global bias, which is basically an average of all the ratings, the user bias, which is an average of all the user features, and the product bias, which is an average of all the, the product features. And basically, you have this. So this is your update process. What you do is you update a row or a column on the latent factors given a learning rate, the error between the, the error of the new rating and the user and uh, product vectors, just the vectors. So what does this mean? This means that when you get a new rating now, instead of calculating of updating the whole thing, you just update these two rows, right? So let's say you, you got like user X and product Y. So you get me and Rambo, right? So you just update the row column, the row me and the column Rambo, right? And this is very good because it actually converges. So in the end, you do get a similar result to this method. And that's really good, right? That means that it's not fully on, online in the sense that you're just not just updating a single value, but you, you can see that if you have like a massive amount of users and a massive amount of movies, you now just need to update one column and one row. That's pretty, pretty handy, right? So it's important to, this method actually is like a, the specific name of the method is called the bias stochastic gradient uh, method of calculating the factorization. So it's important to remember that we're trying to do the same thing, right? Though these two methods, their aim is just to calculate the latent factors. That's it. It's just different approaches of doing it. So on the notebook as well, you have a little demonstration of how this method works. And this is, since this is not implemented on Spark, it's just implemented locally. So this is Python just running on a notebook, but it gives you an idea of the method, right? So there is actually, um, uh, there's a link for a repo, <coughs> sorry, with um, implementation of this method for Spark, if you want to check it out. But since this involves in installing Scala jar or a jar written in Scala for Spark to access, that'll be a bit tricky to do on binder. So, so we decided just to show the, the local Python version. So basically we just read now the data into a matrix, right? So we're not using data frames now, just reading it into a matrix. And okay. Right. Still reading. And the next thing we do, we do the splitting as well. So this time we do the splitting between training and testing. So we do an 80%, 20% split. So you can see the process is quite similar to what we did before in Spark, right? <coughs> Sorry. It's taking a while. Ah. 
I can just show you the, the, the result cells. So basically, what we do next is then we split, right? Since we, we don't have any nice helper functions from Spark, we have to do it manually. So we just split into, into 80%, 20%. We divide the indices and then we use the indices to build two matrices, right? These are sparse matrices. One is a training matrix, the other one is a testing matrix. And we fill them with a, with a value. So basically this is all just creating the training and, and the testing data set. So you can see yeah, the black values are missing. <coughs> so you can see it's quite a, quite a sparse matrix. We don't have many ratings in this sub-matrix. And the second thing we do is initializing the user factors and the product factors. And we initialize them with random values, right? This is all that this is doing, right? We choose a, a, we choose a rank of 20. We could have chosen any other. Actually, we should have tried the parameter search, right? And these are, this is how the parameters look like. So this is like a random uh, feature matrix. And then we, s we choose the learning rate, if you remember the gamma from previously, the user lambda, the item lambda, number max the maximum number of iterations. And this is just a main loop. So you can see it's actually, it's updating the rows, you know, with the gradients. That's all that it's doing, right? But this is doing that for the whole data still. So a nice exercise would be, if you decide now to create a new user, or yourself, or add a new movie, what would you do? You would just add a new column to f item factor and user factor. That's it. And you can just repeat this iteration for that, for that column, right? And this is it. So in a nutshell, this is just like a descriptive way. So you can see it's training for the same data. I mean, it's getting like a similar MSC, considering we didn't even try the simple parameter search, so it's kind of arbitrary parameters. And this is just the evolution of the MSC with iterations, right? So what's the big advantage of streaming data? Well, the big advantage is that if you have a big system, if you have in production a massive data set, you might want to serve predictions very quickly. So you don't want to retrain the model, say, daily. You might want to give it on the fly, right? So this is a good way of doing an online prediction method. A couple of things to keep in mind just to finish. Be obviously, as with any model in machine learning, be wary of the cold start problem, right? So if you're doing something online, you might be tempted to, say, start giving predictions straight away. But the problem is you just might have like 10 users. So all the predictions you're going to give are going to be really bad, right? They might be rubbish. So either train your model offline with a decent size data set or always validate your predictions, right? Be very cautious with what you're predicting in the beginning. The second thing is that parameter search for streaming models is not as, uh, is not as simple as with batch models in a true streaming fashion. Because in a true streaming, streaming system, you're discarding the data. So you get the rating, you train the model, and then you don't, you know, you don't look at that rating anymore. Because if you're saving the ratings and picking them up from a massive data set, then what's the point of using streaming data, right? You might have used just a batch one. So you have to, if you want to retrain the model, in the batch case, that's very simple, right? You just take all the data, retrain the model with the whole thing, that's fine. With streaming, if you want to retrain the model, the whole model from scratch, you need to uh, take all the data into account again, right? So that's a bit an anti-pattern if you don't like streaming, streaming programming. Um, so I think that's it for me, that's the streaming data. Are we okay for questions or yeah. do you wanna? Close the. <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, if any of you has any questions, or I'm sorry we had to rush a little bit this bit, but you know, we I think we're having a nice talk. So, in the end, we just we just finished not doing the whole notebook. But I mean, please try it if you want. If if you have any questions, also you can give. We have issues on the repo. So when Oh, not again. <laughs> uh, when we put the slides online, we'll make sure that we uh, put a link to all of the resources in the last slide. Um, yeah, so we've not got not just the notebook, but also the, the version which will run nicely on OpenShift from Rad Analytics. And then Rui has some really cool implementations of the streaming stuff running outside of a notebook. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll set that up, but please do shout and 
That's right. So we'll make sure that the slides go into that repo. Um, and DevConf puts the slides up, is that right, as well? Uh, we'll collect them as well. Yeah, so when the slides are but can put, put, put online, them the as well. it'll definitely yeah. be in the repo we'll put them on the well. repo, yeah. So, any? Sure, do you want to? How do I know? Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> sorry. How do I know my model is extrapolating with a more complex model than a line? Hmm. So are you talking about, uh, are you still talking about LOS or in general in machine learning or data science? <laughs> I'm not sure if this can be answered in general, but if you can do. <laughs> <laughs> How do you know if, you're, if your model is extrapolating? I mean, it's extrapolating if it. In this case, it's quite easy, right? Yeah, I mean, in it LOS, it's quite easy because if you look at the original data, it's quite bound in terms of of values, right? Say if you have like a website that allows people to do ratings, you know that you're expecting ratings between something and five, zero and five, or one and five, right? So if you start getting uh, ratings of seven, you know obviously that's, you know, something is wrong. So there are a couple of things you could do. You could try to, I mean, probably it's not, it depends on, on obviously what's happening. You could try to renormalize the, the predictions you're getting. You can, you can just ignore them if you think it's like a one-off. It's not a problem with your model. It's like something just with that user that, you know, is... Because, I mean, if you think about it, I mean, on AOS, if you're using a massive data set, like the MovieLens data set has a version of it which has like millions of users and millions of movies, right? So you're always going to get some outliers, some anomalies, and people have weird rating patterns, you know, and, and their predictions are going to be all over the place. So, you know, it's your choice. You see if, you know, you should ignore them or if it's like a systematic problem, then probably you shouldn't ignore it. Uh, but, it, yeah, in this case, since you, you have quite well-defined boundaries for, for the predictions, you know when you're, you're, you're extrapolating. That's true, I agree. Mm -hmm. But you can also think of the example where um, perhaps, yes, all of our scores are between um, naught and five, but it's feasible that actually there's nothing in the region of three to four. And so if someone puts a, a, uh, a value in that sits in this region, you could argue that we're extrapolating here, right? Because we have data here that we fit our model to. We have data here. This is still within the domain, but it doesn't fit any of the data that we've seen before. So I think data extrapolation is part of a bigger problem, and that's to do with your data changing over time. So the input data that you're now seeing not being the same as the data that you've trained on. Um, solutions are tricky, but so what people are doing at the moment is uh, trying to monitor the data that's coming in. So by looking at the data that's coming in and saying, have we seen anything like this before? If your answer is no, then you are going to be extrapolating. You can try continuous validation of the model as well, you know. So yeah. If you, if you do continuous validation of the model, I mean, yeah, in that way it's... Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, it depends on the, on the severity of the extrapolation. You know, if there's something really wrong with your model, you, you, you probably, it's going to be picked up by, by continuous validation. Hey. Is it possible to compute some kind of confidence intervals or something? Is it possible to compute some kind of confidence intervals? Because in a sense, then, uh, it should be Right, so the idea is that if we are giving a prediction from a region where we have a lot of data, then we'd say we are more confident in that than if we were in a region where we have less data. <laughs> Interesting question. Formally, I don't know how you would how you would formally <laughs> compute a confidence interval, but you could certainly, I mean, intuitively, there are quite simple ways to say, okay, the nearest data point we've seen is X close to it, and there's a few in this area, so yes, we are confident versus we don't have that much area in this region, so we're going to take this recommendation, that this prediction that our model is giving you with a pinch of salt. Has anyone done any... Does anyone... Is this anyone's 
area. Does anyone else have any ideas about this? this is well, I guess I would frame just two models, one for the prediction, one for the confidence. Uh, I mean, the confidence can be as simple as a function of the input data, right? Right, right. So the solution would be train two models, one for the prediction, one for the confidence. Are you talking um, about, uh, sorry, sorry, to interrupt you. Sorry, go ahead. I was just kind of repeating the question for the mic. <laughs> Are you talking about like pro a confidence interval, like in the statistical sense of a confidence interval, or just confidence? Yeah, I mean, it's, since we were drawing a well, fresh line, it yeah. kind of came up. You, 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 you can do, do a confidence interval for, for regression uh, prediction. Maybe that first what we are doing is different, but yeah, I, I, the line you draw was such as the topic. Yeah. So, I think one thing you could be doing is to use the, uh, the, the distance in the space of the computed feature vectors for the movies and uh, to say uh, to uh, compute how close uh, it is to the nearest uh, to the nearest movie that actually got uh, enough ratings. That's very hmm. clever. That's very clever. So the suggestion is that because our feature vectors tell us that's lovely because our feature vectors do tell us something about the users and the products, and I mentioned earlier that we can compare them, um, get a distance between two user vectors to compare users and a distance between two movie vectors to compare the movies. We could use that as a notion of distance for how confident we are that we've seen something before. So we could monitor those user factors. Those user factors are tuned by the model, so there's still a chance that we are extrapolating, yeah. but that that might be shown. It would be interesting to investigate. Just to continue on that, would that be like uh, some sort of a, trying to solve a different problem, like classifying users or something like that? Like people who like Right, so the question relates to whether or not this comparison of users and how close are we to other users is related to uh, classification and grouping users and so on. And yes, it certainly is. You could use those feature vectors if you were happy with your trained model to determine users who are similar. Um, so yes, that would be a, a, a classification problem. You can argue that collaborative filtering is doing a very complex classification. All right. Well, a question. Sure. Um, for all this we discussed now to work, we probably should understand what the trained feature vectors mean. Like if I have two users who rate the same and differ in one movie by one star. What does it do to the difference between the land vectors? Is okay. the mean squared error the same or completely different? So <laughs> the question is effectively about the interpretability of the feature vectors and whether or not we can infer what the user feature vectors mean, what the entries in them mean, um, is that correct, in order yes. to uh, compare. So, in, I'm, I'm, I'm clueless, in this case, I don't think that we can, so in that case, if users had uh, rated two identical sets of films and in one film there was one star difference and everything else was the same. I suppose you would be able to look at the feature vectors for those two users and try to infer something, but um, I would argue that it's much more complicated. I think if you wanted that sort of information, I would take a step back and go to a more classic clustering algorithm. You could use a combination of a clustering algorithm and ALS to get that extra information and then infuse that into the model. Well, no complication. I imagine the solution would be simple. The, the, question, the question is what to the weights in, in, uh, in uh, or the, the positions. 
in the system of linear equations. But that's yeah, if you can understand what they mean. If you can understand what the weighted factors mean, let's ask your question. Right? Maybe we could just uh, say if the difference with uh, one user from another is sufficiently small, we could just recommend for those two users the same and tell that they are so close that for us essentially it's for now is the same user. So that would be, uh, so the suggestion is that if two user feature vectors are very similar, then we could just uh, use predictions for one user as predictions for another user. That would save on computational power, perhaps, depending on how many users there are, what we've got to compare, and where we're storing our data. And that could be done in the post-processing stage as well. So that's an interesting tuning. That's correct. So, so maybe it's also interesting to look at because then you have yes, yes, I mean, to over yes, that's always yes, you, that's extra information you have that you don't use in this case. Yeah, so, we haven't used yeah. that information, the tags at all in this. Oh my gosh, this notebook is long. Okay, so yes, there's the ratings file, tags, movies, links, which is links to the um, I think it's to the IMDb of the. Um, film itself, so you could even do, so you can get extra information from there, actors who are in the film, it tells you the genres in there, you could do some cool statistical analysis of the movie poster, you could look at the average rating given by IMDB and so on. So there's lots yes. of ways to expand this if you were going to try and take the recommendation and put it into production. This is actually like the standard alternative weeks with squares methods, right? And I know lots of research uh, has been happening uh, has been happening in the literature after this. There's actually an interesting paper, which I don't have the link here, where um, Monte Carlo sampling is used on the actual future future uh, matrices, right? To so so actually close to what you were saying, you know. So so you're sampling from a region of probability of, of users being close together or movies being together. So and apparently it's like a massive. Uh, boost in performance, obviously, because it's just taking approximated values from the users and, 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 and uh, projects. So obviously, all that we talked about here is like standard ALS, so a bit like a crash course introduction on ALS. But obviously, this is now, as many things, like probably one year after this is done, it's not state of the art, obviously. So if you go to the literature, you'll find many, many new techniques that expand on ALS, you know, and build on ALS. And, and are worth reading if, if you're really uh, into, into the, the field. They're very interesting reads. So I think with that, we'd better call it quits. Um, thank you so much for turning up and engaging. Really appreciate it, um, especially after the party. And um, if you hang around in this room, then our colleagues, Will Benton and Mike McEwen, are going to give a uh, workshop on streaming applications. That's using Rad Analytics, um, some of the tools that the team has created. So, would recommend, but won't be offended if you leave. Cheers. Thank you.